Hey, welcome to the Everyday Immunity Podcast, a place where we talk about different ways to boost the immune system naturally each and every day. I'm your host, Alicia Rosati of Rosati Nutrition. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. I am so excited for today's episode, and I won't lie, um, I'm a little bit nervous talking about this because this is such a touchy subject, I'm sure you know. Um, There's so many legal ramifications when talking about this, which makes it a little bit sketchy. You know, it's such a sensitive topic because so many people know someone dealing with this. But you know what? That's what I'm here for and that's why I set out on this journey as being a holistic nutritionist and why I chose this avenue over others because I wanted to talk about these things and share the knowledge that I have and, you know, I don't know all the answers but I want to at least share the answers that I find along the way. Um, But before we get back on into that, um, I did want to say obviously welcome back Um, I also want to let you guys know that I am uploading more videos on YouTube um, quite frequently. So not only can you watch me here, as some of you are right now on YouTube, uh, watch me record these podcast episodes, but I also have some uh, videos on there with different recipes and my detox journey and all of that fun stuff. So more videos are on the way. Um, definitely go check out my YouTube channel. It's just Rosati Nutrition. Um, and yeah, I really hope you guys join that community and we can grow it into something super fun and awesome with a ton of people. So definitely check that out. Um, And another place I want you guys to check out, if you have Facebook, I want you guys to go ahead and request to join my health club. So it's called Rosati Nutrition Health Club. And I'm posting a lot of stuff in there. Uh, It's a very, I'm trying to build a very like group-like community, a very engaging community. And I'm dropping some more stuff very, very soon about more group activities, I'll say. Um, so definitely go check out the Facebook group. I go live on there a lot. And, uh, yeah, I know some of you listeners are already members of the Facebook group, which is fantastic. I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, invite all of your friends to join the Facebook group. Okay, guys, (laughs) I can't say that enough. I want to really grow this Facebook group and make it a really informational, educational, fun, encouraging group community space. So go check that out. I also wanted to touch on really quick, um, I don't know where you guys are living, but I'm in Toronto and as I'm recording this right now, it is like literally a heat wave outside. It is so beyond hot and humid and muggy and just so disgusting outside. Um, And I know I shouldn't complain because winter was long, longer than normal, especially with COVID. So I'm enjoying it. Um, You know, we got the salt water beach waves going on so I am enjoying the heat it's just I really sympathize with those of you who work physical jobs who work outdoor jobs you know I I really really feel for you guys um and please stay safe so let me know in the comments if you're watching uh on YouTube what the weather is like where you guys are at currently and uh yeah I'm curious okay enough of my ramblings um so today's topic we are talking about IV vitamin C or intravenous vitamin C as a potential treatment for cancer. Now, I kind of gave a little bit of a disclaimer, but again, to reiterate, I really do sympathize with those of you who either are dealing with cancer, have dealt with cancer, know someone dealing with cancer, have lost someone to cancer. Um, cancer sucks. We all know that. It's, it's a really tragic and crappy thing. So I really, really sympathize with you guys. Um, and yeah, it, it, I don't know what else to say other than I sympathize. I know what it's like. I personally have never had to experience cancer and I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, but I did lose my grandfather to cancer. So I also understand that aspect of it, of dealing with cancer in the family. So I really do feel for you guys. Um, and actually my grandfather is the one who kind of brought me here 
to this uh, story today. So my grandfather had been dealing with cancer on and off for quite a few years. Um, He was in remission for a really long time. And then we found that it had come back. And I don't want to really get into that story too much, but um, I do believe that it could have been the extent of his cancer could have been avoidable and it could have been detected earlier, uh, but it wasn't. So when we knew that, you know, he had cancer, it was it was already too far progressed to really do anything um, really substantial. So, you know, but of course, we're trying to find out all of our options and this and that. And we went to the naturopathic college that, again, I have talked about so many times in this podcast. I'm sure you guys have heard me speak of it before. Uh, So we brought my grandfather there and they were very honest and upfront with us. And they were like, you know, if you would have come to us maybe a couple months ago, I think we really could have given given him a, a really good fighting chance. But it's just too late to do anything at this point that would really be worthwhile without, um, worsening his quality of life so that had to come into play uh but what they had suggested that they could have done was a vitamin c iv drip huh i was so like i wasn't there specifically but i remember my dad told me this is what they had recommended that they wanted to do uh and so i looked into it what do you mean vitamin c in an iv for cancer like huh like isn't that just vitamin C, you know, you take it for a cold or a flu, uh, when you're starting to feel sick, you know, you get your orange juice or whatever, but I didn't know that there was something that you could do, uh, with vitamin C for cancer specifically. So I was really, really intrigued. And I've been talking about this for years, pretty much since I found out that that was a potential treatment. And I have been telling people here and there, and the people that I've been telling, no one else has heard of this either. No one has heard of vitamin C having anything to do with cancer or, you know, even being a a thought of a treatment for cancer. So I knew that, you know, there's not enough education on this, at least here in North America. Um, So yeah, so I really want to get this message out there. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not like a, a genius when it comes to this, but these are the studies that I have found and the research that I have found. This is what it's saying. So before I get ahead of myself a little bit too much, which I feel like I may have already, um, let's talk about one of the most important things. What even is cancer? We throw that word around so much, but does anybody actually know like what cancer is? So let's see. So there's two criteria for all kinds of cancer. Um, They grow, these cells grow uncontrollably and they have the ability to metastasize. And that's when, you know, it grows into a tumor and it spreads throughout your body kind of thing. So there are uh, a few different factors involved in determining who gets cancer and who doesn't because how is it that, you know, Sally down the street has cancer, but I don't and we grew up together and live the same kind of life. How does this come to play? Or how does my grandfather have cancer, but I don't? You know what I mean? So um, there's a, it's a combination of things. It's genetics, it's um, behavioral factors, lifestyle factors, dietary factors, All of that comes into play to give you a a risk, to determine your risk of developing cancer. So, you know, someone could be living a super healthy lifestyle, but not know that they have a genetic predisposition, predisposition and, you know, they're eating super clean and they're exercising and things like that and they still develop cancer, but they didn't know they had their the genetic predisposition and maybe their lifestyle factors weren't super clean. Maybe they were exposing themselves to a carcinogen every single day without realizing it. We don't know. So all of that really does come into play. Um, And what happens is these different factors will lead to normal cells turning into abnormal cells, turning into cancer cells. So every one of us has cancer cells. We all have it. However, we have an innate ability to be able to kill those cancer cells. That's what part of our immune system does. So specifically, they're called NK cells or our natural killer cells. And what they are literally born to do is to find any abnormal cells in your body and kill them off. That's pretty much it. Uh, They have different ways of doing this through a method of apoptosis or however it's pronounced. Apparently, it's pronounced a ton of different ways, but apoptosis, uh, which is cell death, or there's um, there's other ways, but basically that's what 
those NK cells do is they detect abnormal cells in your own body and they make them die. Um, so <laughs> what happens is people who develop cancer, you know, something is wrong with their immune system that their NK cells either can't detect these cancer cells or they are not strong enough to kill them off and fight them off. Now, cancer itself is not so clear cut. It's not like you have this cancer and that's it. No, there's actually over a hundred different varieties of cancer, which is um, quite alarming because, you know, I, I personally think that the number of the rates of cancer are just through the roof and a lot of different associations and organizations and things have said that the cancer rates have gone down in recent years, but personally, I still see so many people being diagnosed with cancer and different kinds of cancer, so we'll get into that. But the four main um, categories of cancer are carcinomas, which affect your skin, mucous membranes, uh, different glands, and internal organs, uh, leukemias, which affect your blood and your tissues, sarcomas, which uh, usually affect your muscle and connective tissue and bones, and finally, lymphomas, which affect your lymphatic system. So, you know, maybe you yourself are not dealing with any one of these cancers, but I, I'm pretty sure you probably know of someone who has or is currently dealing with one of these forms of cancer. They're very, very common, unfortunately. So, that's what they are. Now, speaking of common, there's a couple different um, conventional treatments that are really common nowadays, and those include chemo or chemotherapy and radiation. Those are usually the two big main ones. Now, chemotherapy involves different drugs, and there's so many different chemotherapy drugs that do different things and, and, you know, are best for different kinds of cancer, attack different things, do different things in your body, whatnot. Um, and then there's also radiation that will literally, like, kill and burn off the cancer cells. Uh, so those are the two main ones. Now, recently, immune, immunotherapy has become really, really popular as well. And what that is, is basically uh, manipulating your immune system to attack these uh, cancer cells which is quite cool because you're not really, I mean, you are, but you're not using outside um, resources, I guess. You're not depending on a chemotherapy drug or a radiation beam. You know, you're depending on your own immune system, but it's being manipulated by an outside source, source which is probably a drug. So those are really the main um, forms of treatment. However, there's also this vitamin C treatment. Now, I know we've been, I've kind of been talking about it and, okay, Alicia, what is this vitamin C treatment? Now, this is not new, I will say. This is not new. This has been studied for decades, which is crazy because, you know, it's out there. It's been known. It's, it's something that people do. So why do not many of us know about it, especially for a condition that is so common in our society? I'm sure we all know of someone who has cancer, like I said, but I'm sure all those people who know someone who has cancer didn't know about vitamin C therapy. You see what I'm saying? There's, it's not, it's not like the same kind of, what am I trying to say? Oh, what's the word? It is not correlated. The amount of people that know someone with cancer and the amount of people that know that vitamin C is a cancer treatment. Okay, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so basically, um, before we get into how this works, I want to talk to you guys about your mitochondria. Some of you guys don't even know what a mitochondria is, and that's fine. All you have to know is, think of your cell, a regular human cell. Now, you have organelles in those cells, and those organelles are like miniature organs that function inside your cell to do specific things. So, you know, think of your stomach digests your food, and your lungs uh, make you breathe so you can absorb oxygen. Well, these little organelles do do things like that in the cell, so on a very, very, very minuscule scale. Now, one of those organelles is called mitochondria, and these guys are the powerhouse of your cell. What they do is they make energy in the form of something called ATP. Now, when mitochondria do this, they release a byproduct, and this is what we call oxidative stress. You guys have heard me talk about oxidative stress before. Uh, and oxidative stress, we usually want to minimize that because, 
it's dangerous to our cells. It causes a lot of damage. That's why we eat our antioxidant foods like berries and things like that. Now, what that, um, that oxidative stress is specifically called is called superoxide. And that's very, very damaging to our cells. It's super toxic. So what happens is our body neutralizes that superoxide and turns it into something called hydrogen peroxide. I know you guys have heard of this before. You know, if you cut yourself open, you usually go spray it with some hydrogen peroxide to get rid of any infection. So your body is actually making hydrogen peroxide inside of your body while trying to minimize the risk of superoxide. This does not mean you can go drink hydrogen peroxide to kill off a virus, a bacteria, an infection. Do not do that, okay? Do not ingest hydrogen peroxide. It's not the same. It just, it doesn't work that way. Don't do it. Please, as a disclaimer, do not ever ingest hydrogen peroxide. So, when, so, okay, quick recap. Your mitochondria makes energy and as a byproduct, it makes oxidative waste called superoxide. Superoxide is super toxic, so you want to minimize that and your body converts superoxide into hydrogen peroxide and oxygen, okay? Now, the hydrogen peroxide is key here. That's what we really want to focus on. When we have a vitamin C IV, so, you know, you hook up to an IV drip for a few hours um, and, and it's pumped with vitamin C, what happens is your body metabolizes that vitamin C in a very complicated way, but for simplicity reasons, uh, it metabolizes vitamin C into hydrogen peroxide, okay? So why do we want this? Because I thought hydrogen peroxide was still kind of toxic. It's still a pro-oxidant, so the opposite of an antioxidant. But what researchers have found out is this hydrogen peroxide is actually not damaging to our healthy and normal cells. It's only damaging to cancer cells. So this is, this is the key important part here. This is the money right here. So the hydrogen peroxide is going to attack, not necessarily attack, but when it's free floating in our body, it's very damaging to the cancer cells. The cancer cells are attracted to it, they absorb it, and it causes self, or sorry, cell death in the form of apoptosis. So remember that word, okay? So vitamin C metabolizes in your body into hydrogen peroxide. Cancer cells are attracted to this hydrogen peroxide. They absorb it, and that's what causes the cells to die. Now, in, in previous years and previous research, researchers did think that this hydrogen peroxide was also toxic to normal cells, and that's why we wanted to minimize that, and they were like, no, vitamin C IV is not good. It's still toxic to normal cells. It's just, it's not a good thing because it turns into a pro-oxidant and causes lots of damage. But more recent research has realized that no, although it is a pro-oxidant and it does cause damage, it does not cause damage to normal cells. It only causes damage to cancer cells. So again, this is super important and this is basically why this, this treatment works. So let's look at some studies specifically um, to see what these researchers have said. Okay, so this one study, high-dose vitamin C in advanced stage cancer patients, says, and I'm quoting this, potential anti-cancer properties of ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, have been known since the 1960s when it was shown to be highly toxic or lethal to carcinoma cells in vitro while it remained non-toxic to normal body tissues. Now, it gives the specific kind of carcinoma cells, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, so be sure to check out the show notes or the podcast notes um, wherever you're listening to this, and you'll know exactly what kind of carcinoma cells I'm talking about if you cared for that, but I'm not going to try to pronounce this. <laughs> so, it's been known since the 1960s. Like, this is not, this is not, I guess, it, in relative terms, it's not that long ago. The 60s are not that long ago. However, from the 60s to now and you know the way science advances i it, it's we've known about this for quite some time is what i'm trying to get at okay and i think more people need to know about this for the amount of time that science has known about this so that's what that said now later on in that same study it also says again quoting this 
This occurs because cancer cells selectively take up more ascorbate compared to normal cells through the facilitated transport with participation of glucose transporters due to an increased metabolic need for glucose. So that's a lot of mumble jumble. What does that mean? Basically, it's saying that these cancer cells uptake more ascorbate or vitamin C because of the transporter that they use. Um, And it's because cancer cells have a higher need for glucose. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but cancer feeds on sugar. So one thing, going back to my grandfather's story that really, you know, ticked me off was his cancer doctor told him to start drinking these Ensure shakes, which were like meal replacement shakes. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen these or looked at the ingredient list, but one of the first ingredients is sugar. Cancer feeds on sugar. That is a known fact. We just hear this in this study. There's countless other studies that have backed this up. Cancer feeds on sugar. So I was really ticked off when my grandfather's um, cancer doctor or oncologist told him to take these Ensure drinks every day that are just loaded up with sugar. So if you guys know someone who's taking those Ensure drinks, personally, I recommend not to take them. And, you know, my naturopaths and and along the years and things like that have also said not to take those to avoid sugar as best as possible. Now, I understand why his oncologist may have prescribed those because, um, you know, chemo and radiation and, and cancer itself really can affect your appetite, your nausea, things like that. And you do need to make sure that you are, uh, staying on top of your nutrition, getting enough calories and things like that. However, I think there are better alternatives out there than a sugar-filled Ensure drink. So again, if you know someone or if you are taking those, look at the ingredient list. It's just loaded up with a ton of crap, okay? I do not think that those are great. Um, So getting back to this, yeah, these studies are showing that cancer cells do uptake more vitamin C and it does cause cell death. Now, there was another study that said, oh, sorry about the paper. Um, So this says, there is limited high quality clinical evidence on the safety and effectiveness of IVC, which is intravenous vitamin C. The existing evidence is preliminary and cannot be considered conclusive, but is suggestive of a good safety profile and potentially important anti-tumor activity. IVC may improve the quality of life and symptom severity of patients with cancer and several cases of remission have been reported. Now, this is a kind of an iffier thing that I want to touch on. Um, A lot of physicians here in North America have spoken out on alternative therapies for cancer. However, they have been silenced. I don't want to get into a big conspiracy debate here, but It's just truth that a lot of physicians, naturopathic or medical doctors, whatever they are, uh, alternative healers, anybody, they know of alternative therapies that do work and they have been silenced, unfortunately. They have been threatened by the FDA, you know, they have been um, charged for malpractice or practicing medicine without a license, things like that. And I really, that really ticks me off. And like I said, I don't want to get into a big conspiracy debate here, but think about it. You know, the cancer industry is one of the richest industries. So that's where I'm going to leave it. I don't really want to get too into it, but they are a very rich industry. So if they were to go out of business because of things that did work and did heal people and did cure cancer, what would happen to that industry? That's where I'm going to leave that at. Um, Now, in Europe... A lot of physicians do use these alternative therapies solely, like just vitamin C and just alternative therapies, like whether they're herbs or diet or things like that. And they have really promising results. So you guys can look up, like there's there's so many celebrities or big known names from North America or a lot of people, you know, that have or have had cancer and have gone to Europe for treatment. Why is that? Why is that? That uh, To me, that seems kind of sketchy. That seems a little bit of a problem. Um, and that says something about our medical system. So 
just think about that. <laughs> you know, leave a comment if you guys want. I would really like to hear your thoughts on this um, and let's have a discussion about it. That's what we're here for. So yeah, but anyways, getting back to this, it does say that it may improve the quality of life and symptom severity and a lot of studies that I were reading are saying that vitamin C is effective as um, a, a, a therapy with or alongside chemo or radiation, usually chemotherapy. Um, and I guess that's like a safer way of saying that vitamin C works, but without saying that that's the only thing that's needed. So again, do with that what you will. Um, that's, that's really my opinion on it. So yeah. Um, but this does say several cases of remission have been reported with IVC or intravenous vitamin C. Now, Finally, you guys, I don't want to make this episode too, too, too long and we're kind of getting there. Um, but I did want, this is the one, sorry, I'm all over the place with my notes. I apologize. Now, this uh, study said that vitamin C um, is generally safe because I know, of course, there's the safety concern. Uh, but it says no, there's known complications of vitamin C IV with people with uh, renal impairment or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, but this is not for the general majority of people. So other than uh, individuals dealing with those two conditions, it is relatively completely safe, is what this says. Other than those conditions, it appears to be completely safe. Those are not my words. This is the study's words. So, <laughs> you know, it does sound very safe. It sounds very promising. Whether you feel better using vitamin C IV alongside chemotherapy or radiation, whatever that may be, or whether you feel better, um, you know, using chemotherapy, uh, sorry, using vitamin C IV on its own with different herbs and diet and things like that, whatever makes you feel most comfortable. Um, but it, I think it should be talked about as an optional treatment, as an option, because I know, like I said, I don't have cancer. I've never had cancer, but speaking from the experience with my grandfather, you know, when you have a diagnosis like this, it may feel like you have no options. You have nothing left to do. There's, you know, you hit a brick wall, there's nothing to do. You kind of have to just take it as it is. But if I think if there's another option that may work, why not exhaust all options? Why are we not told of all our options? I think everybody should be told of all the options out there. So I'm here to tell you there is another option. There is a very promising option. It's called vitamin C IV or high dose vitamin C. Um, look into it yourself. Make up a decision for yourself. And yeah, I found it fascinating. I wanted to share it with you guys. I thought it was really cool and really promising. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop rambling about vitamin C IV now. And I want to listen back to this and... and count how many times I've said vitamin C <laughs> in this episode. I, I'm curious. But anyways, you guys, that is my little tidbit of information for today. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. I really appreciate each and every one of you here. Don't forget to like and subscribe on Facebook uh, or sorry, on YouTube. And don't forget to check out the Facebook group, the community group, Rosati Nutrition Health Club and Rosati Nutrition on YouTube. Now, that's it for me today and uh yeah i will talk to you guys in the next episode Peace.